Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's my great privilege and honor to introduce Sister Dr. Ana Maria Pineda, a member of the Sisters of Mercy. She holds an MA from the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago and an STD from the Pontifical University of Salamanca, Spain, where her dissertation examined the Hispanic permanent diaconate in the United States. A native of El Salvador, Sister Dr. Pineda is a past faculty member at the Catholic Theological Union and past president of the Ac Academy of Catholic Hispanic Theology in the United States. In addition, she has served on the boards of the Louisville Institute and the Bishop's Committee for Hispanic Affairs, among others, and is a founding member of the Hispanic Theological Initiative. Sister Dr. Pineda joined the Santa Clara University faculty in 1997 and served as director of the graduate program in pastoral ministries from 1999 to 2005. She currently teaches courses on Hispanic spirituality and theology. With Robert Schreider, Pineda co-edited Dialogue Rejoin, Theology and Ministry in the United States Hispanic Reality. And within this past year, she published Romero and Grande Companions on the Journey. And um, this is what it looks like, and it's for sale right out here in the lobby. Uh, this is the 37th anniversary of the assassination of Blessed Oscar Romero. And uh, it's hard to think of or imagine anyone uh, better suited to uh, help us engage in mystagogy together, academic, pastoral, and theological around her topic today, Oscar Romero, social justice, its call and its cost. Please join me in welcoming Sister Dr. Ana Maria Pineda. Good morning. Please let me uh, begin by expressing my deep and profound thank you uh, for this kind invitation to be here, uh, Bill Purcell, on this great day of the Feast of uh, Blessed Oscar Romero. It coincided beautifully. And I also want to thank Paula and Kyle for their warm and lovely hospitality. And I kept thinking uh, last night and today, if a sign of a Christian is our hospitality, there are Christians here and wonderful people. So as I mentioned, can everyone hear me pretty clearly? So just raise your hand. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, today is the feast of Blessed Oscar Romero of El Salvador. And it's a particular blessing that the date coincides with this keynote address entitled Oscar Romero, Social Justice, Its Call and Cost. Two years ago, on May the 23rd, 2015, I was in El Salvador at the beatification of Oscar Romero along with 300,000 others, people from all over the world. Actually, I heard it was more like 400,000, but it could be a touch of Salvadoreño pride and, you know, making it sound all the more wonderful. During the celebration, a message from Pope Francis was read, which seems most appropriate for today, and I quote, on this feast day for the Salvadorian nation and also for the neighboring Latin American countries, let us give thanks to God because he granted the martyred bishop the ability to see and hear the suffering of his people and molded his heart so that in his name he could direct them and illuminate them to the point of making of his work a full exercise of Christian charity." End of quote. Francis' words of gratitude draw our attention to Romero's capacity 
to see and hear the cries of the poor, a theme that was repeated in a variety of ways during the beatification ceremony. It was this capacity of seeing and hearing that shaped and molded Romero's heart to such a degree that it enabled him to love fully with the ultimate gift of his life. At a later moment, Cardinal Angelo Amato proceeded to ask this question. Who was Romero? How did he prepare for martyrdom? Let's say first and foremost that Romero was a good priest, a wise bishop, but mostly he was a virtuous man. He loved Jesus. He adored them in the Eucharist. He venerated the Virgin Mary. He loved the church. He loved the Pope. He loved his people. Martyrdom was not an improvisation, but came after a long preparation." End of quote. I recall that these words stayed with me, especially the sentence, martyrdom was not an improvisation, but came after a long preparation. Indeed, martyrdom only came after a lifetime journey for Romero. Today, I will address three dimensions of this preparation. First, a consideration of his life and signs of call that emerge within that life. Second, Romero's intellectual and early interest in the teaching of the Catholic social teachings. And third, the images of the crucified and the crucified peoples that reshape his intellectual engagement with the social teachings of the church. Romero's preparation toward martyrdom began at his birth on August 15, 1917, the Feast of the Assumption of Mary in Ciudad Varios in the San Miguel Department of El Salvador. This preparation toward martyrdom unfolded as the young boy dealt early on at the age of five with a serious illness that left him weak and paralyzed. Over time, the child Oscar relearned how to walk, speak, and feed himself. However, the illness marked him in other ways. Since his condition was never diagnosed, the townspeople kept their children at a distance. All of this contributed to Oscar's isolation from his own childhood peers, and at times from his own family. Oscar suffered under the burden of his own physical fragility. He was a rather shy and timid boy. He came across to others as aloof, an outward manifestation of his inner insecurity and shyness. This early encounter with illness left Romero with other marked tendencies that accompanied him into adulthood. The solicitous care of his family accustomed Oscar to expect special treatment. He seemed to have inherited his father Santos Romero's inclination to outburst of anger. Unfortunately, this aspect of his father's character would carry into Oscar's adulthood. In his spiritual diary, the developing Oscar often referenced his resolution to overcome this tendency to anger. In other aspects of his life, Romero was gifted. He mastered the use of telegraph machine as he worked alongside his father. In addition, from his father, he also learned carpentry techniques. His father also enjoyed music and played the flute and passed this, on, passed this love on to his son. Oscar also developed a great love for reading from his father. And unknown to Romero, these skills were preparing him to become the masterful communicator of a future time. In the midst of these childhood realities, Oscar seemed internally drawn to prayer. The town's mayor, Alfonso Levia, noted that the boy after helping his father deliver telegrams, would take time to stop at church to pray 
and visit the saints. Kneeling at the foot of the tabernacle, young Oscar would lose himself in prayer, a practice that accompanied him into adulthood. His father, Santos Romero, was the one who taught Oscar the basic prayers, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Creed, the Angelus. His father also played his flute at all the religious festivities, and the whole family joined their father in these processions and religious events. Inspired by these religious observances, Romero would prepare his own processions with the help of a select group of friends. The boy Romero was slowly being drawn to God. It was a call initiated by the God that he was discovering in his own youthful fragility, within the embrace of daily family life, in participating in the religious practices of his hometown, in the quiet moments he often spent on his knees in front of the Eucharist. Oscar was being prepared for yet another call. The call to the priesthood came when he was 13 years old. The town's mayor had noted the young Romero's devotion to the church. And I had often observed Oscar's daily visits to the parish. When the first bishop of San Miguel Juan Antonio Duenas y Argumedo came to town on a pastoral visit. The mayor mentioned to the bishop that he thought that Oscar Romero had a vocation to the priesthood. This observation led to the initial encounter between the bishop and Oscar. Years later, in a beautiful account written by author Maria Vigil, the then Archbishop Romero recalled how the bishop called to him in front of the crowd of townspeople and asked him what he wanted to be. Oscar replied that he wanted to be a priest. With that, the bishop raised his finger and pointed it straight at Oscar's forehead, announcing that Romero was going to be a bishop. Fifty years later, Monsignor Romero touched that place on his forehead and told Maria Vigil, I can still feel the touch of his finger right here. The following year, Romero entered the minor seminary in San Miguel, where under the tutelage of the Claritian order, he deepened his love for Mary, the mother of God and the blessed sacrament. At the seminary, Oscar honed his skills in these early years, Romero showed promising signs of becoming a gifted public speaker. In 1937, Romero was sent to Rome for doctoral studies. His years in Rome coincided with World War II. Later, looking back to those years, Romero shared how the austere reality of the war severely impacted the life in the House of Studies. Food was often scarce, and the seminarians lived on whatever the rector could procure. Romero also saw firsthand the dire situation of the ordinary people. One day, as he made his way through the streets of Rome, he encountered a man who was begging for food. The gaunt image of the man disturbed Romero deeply. Upon returning to the house of studies, Romero went to the kitchen and against the house rules, took food and gave it to the poor beggar. In other moments of his life, he would continue to encounter the poor and see in their faces that of the crucified one that spoke to him, not only as he knelt at the foot of the tabernacle, but in the gaunt faces of the suffering poor. The image of the crucified Christ would become part of his priestly aspirations as he expressed in a short article that he wrote in 1940, and I quote, to be a crucified one with Christ who redeems, to be one with the resurrected Christ who shares resurrection and life, end of quote. Looking to the crucified Christ, 
Romero found meaningful identification not only with the suffering Christ crucified, but also with suffering humanity. In 1943, after his ordination, Romero left Rome to return to El Salvador. En route, Romero and his companion, Rafael Valladares, were detained in Cuba. Romero and his companion spent time in a Cuban concentration camp where they suffered hardships. Finally, they were released through the efforts of the Redemptorist priest in Havana. Arriving in San Miguel, El Salvador, the two men were welcomed with a great feast. Romero requested that special attention be given to the poor of the town. Perhaps he continued to be haunted by the faces of the poor and destitute that he, that he had encountered during his time of study in Rome. He himself had experienced in his own flesh the scarcity of food and the deprivation that was brought upon so, upon so many. Shortly after his return to El Salvador, Romero was assigned to a parish in the small town of Anamoros, a locale so small that it lacked a store, running water, and light. Oscar Romero seemed to embrace this assignment generously, seeing in it a response to God's call. Within a few months, he was assigned to San Miguel as secretary of the diocese, where he would dedicate 23 years of his life, 23 years. While his main ministerial responsibility was to be the secretary to the bishop, Romero attended to other pastoral activities. Nevertheless, his administrative work was his main occupation and preoccupation. During his years in San Miguel, his stern appraisal of brother priests did little to engender affection. Romero had always rigorously tried to integrate a high and demanding sense of priesthood into every aspect of his priestly life. He was impatient with the behavior of many of the diocesan priests who interpreted the outcomes of the Second Vatican Council in ways that Romero felt threatened the sanctity of the priesthood. Romero was often openly critical of the modern attire that priests were adopting or their direct engagement with the laity outside of purely sacramental occasions. For Romero, loyalty to the Pope and the correct interpretation of the Second Vatican Council was to be embraced by all. A man of great intellectual interest and ability, Romero had a habit of staying current on all the speeches, activities, and directives from the Pope and the Vatican, a practice probably heavily influenced by his studies in Rome and later accentuated by his three years as Archbishop of El Salvador. During his lifetime, Romero kept a daily diary, copious recordings of his homilies, approximately 196 Sunday homilies, five pastoral letters, as well as his file of retreat notes, personal letters, and approximately 5,000 letters written to the faithful who sought his advice. All of this paints a portrait of his being an erudite life. Few pastors have left behind such a recorded legacy. In his file of writings, there is evidence that in the midst of a very full ministerial life, he found time to study and keep current with the church's teaching. In May of 1967, he attended a social training course. Afterwards, Romero took the time to prepare five typed pages of notes for the papal nuncio. These notes offer us a glimpse into Romero's assessment of the church's social teaching. 
and it's to this point that I now want to draw our, our attention. So on the screen, you actually see page five of these notes that he uh, took for the papal nuncio, and in the corner, in his handwriting, he indicates that it's to the papal nuncio. In the opening paragraph of his notes, Romero praises Pope Leo XIII's encyclical, Rerum Novarum, the condition of labor. He considers Leo XIII, and in his words, to be the irreplaceable arbiter and guiding light of the formidable social question. For Romero, Leo XIII is a prophet in his affirmation, and I quote, it is the church that proclaims from the gospel those teachings by which the conflict can be brought to an end, or at least made far less bitter, end of quote. Romero continues noting that successive popes have many times looked back at that luminous landmark, which Pope Pius XII referred to, in his words, as the charter of Christian social activity, whose norms became almost the common her heritage of the entire human family. Romero, in his note, reminds the papal nuncio, and as you know well, it is not that the church preserves, as in an antique chest, its documents, its social doctrine to only contemplate it with a passive gaze. No, once the modern popes have turned their attention to the Magna Carta of the social question, it has been to repeat their eternal postulates in the light of a continuous process of aggiornamento. In continuation, Romero summarized and highlighted the contributions of the successive papal encyclicals. And here I'm going to provide a summary almost using Romero's uh, words. Pius XI's Quadresimo Anno after 40 years, which is written during the difficult political times in which Pius XI lived. The wise addresses of the angelic Pius XII, which illuminated the social doctrine with the tragic flashes of a world in turmoil, in which the war is fought more with ideas than weapons. John XXIII, the good peasant of ecumenical vision, emphasizes in his immortal Mater et Magistra the merits and anguishes of the people of the countryside and the internal and the international character of social justice and charity that should govern the mutual assistance of post-war peoples. And Romero makes mention of the Second Vatican Council's affirmation of the intention to strengthen these principles given the current circumstances and to give some guidance looking especially at the economic development requirements. And while highlighting the importance of each papal encyclical in his notes, Father Romero holds the highest praise for Populorum Progressio, in which his views coincide with words he attributes, it, attributes to F. Guerrero. I have not seen in any document of the church so clearly the strength and timeliness of the gospel to solve the economic and social problems of the world. It seems like a live remembrance, without space deferred from the centuries, of the message that exhilarated the crowds who saw and heard Jesus. It occurs to us that perhaps this direct formulation, without passing through the filter of successive subtle and sober comments, constitutes the virtue of the document. It reminds us of St. Francis of Assisi's attempt to apply the gospel without gloss. These notes, written by Romero for the benefit of the papal nuncio, continue to highlight the importance that economic systems protect the rights of men and women, especially the poorest. After all, the economy is at the service of man. 
No one is justified in keeping for his exclusive use what he does not need when others lack necessities. Romero chooses to focus on the following lines of the document, and I quote, it is unacceptable that citizens with abundant incomes from the resources and activity of their country should transfer a considerable part of this income abroad purely for their own advantage without care for the manifest wrong they inflict on their country by doing this, end of quote. Toward the end of his notes, Romero states, our Christian social doctrine is an evangelical affirmation of justice, of charity, of freedom, of dignity. Lastly, in his notes, he encourages the role of the laity in the life of the church, calling for their service to be directed toward all men and women to the universal brotherhood. These notes, written in May of 1967, at the end of his ministry in San Miguel as secretary to the diocese, gives us an insight not only into his love for the church and its teaching, but the depth of his intellectual engagement with their meaning and its significance for Christians. But I would offer that the Romero of 1967 is still on a journey that will lead him not only to intellectually accept the teachings of the church, but also to see in the printed words of the church's documents, the faces of people that he would later encounter in ministries that placed him into direct contact with the daily lives of the suffering people. His move in 1967 from San Miguel to live at the seminary of San Salvador while he assumed the secretarial role for the Conference of Bishops, would introduce him to Jesuit Rutilio Grande, an encounter that would mark Romero's life in unimaginable, in unimaginable ways and to which I will return. Three years later, in 1970, Romero was named Auxiliary Bishop of San Salvador, his appointment was not well received by the clergy who saw the conservative Romero at odds with the directions articulated by the Latin American bishops gathered in Medellin, Colombia. Furthermore, for the clergy who were struggling to find a pastoral approach to serve the poor, the expense of Romero's Episcopal ordination was considered scandalous in a poverty-riddled country. During the four years as auxiliary bishop of El Salvador, Romero rarely attended meetings of the clergy. He felt the meetings merely provided a forum for the priests to complain about the church and the pope. As regards to pastoral matters, Romero was predisposed to the advice of Archbishop Emmanuel Gerarda, the papal nuncio and one of his stronger supporters. Painfully aware of Romero's Roman favoritism, the priest distrust, distrusted the new auxiliary. But Romero, who struggled to be faithful to God, to the church, and to the truth as he understood it, and to whatever was asked of him, continued to believe that he was responding to God's call. Perhaps, Lost in an academic reading of church documents, he had lost the direct contact with the suffering men and women of El Salvador, but this would soon change. In 1974, Romero was named Bishop of Santiago de Maria. He interpreted his selection as bishop as a public affirmation by Rome of his pastoral style and service Yet in Santiago de Maria, Romero would come into direct pastoral contact with the reality of the poor. In his own words, there I indeed ran head on into abject misery with those children that would die merely because of the water that they drank, with those peasants ill-treated in the coffee fields. 
It is the faces of suffering children, women and men, which touches the core of Romero's being and which enfleshes for him the words of the papal decrees that he deeply cherished. For the first time in many years, probably since the days of his own boyhood, Romero came into direct contact with the humble people of El Salvador. As he ventured out to be with the people, he discovered them living in deplorable poverty. Men worked excessive hours in the coffee fields, but received miserly pay from the landowners. Those landowners, however, had been Romero's friends, and he wanted desperately to believe that they were good Christians who treated their workers justly. Disillusioned by the innate selfishness of the money class and overwhelmed by the insidious poverty of the poor people of his diocese, Romero began to search for new understandings. At his first meeting with his clergy in Santiago de Maria, Romero expressed his deepest desire, and he said to them, help me to see clearly. For Romero, the reality of the poor with whom he was in close contact began to reveal truths that would lead him implacably along the road of transformation that he so desired to a culmination that he could not have anticipated. His years in Rome and the subsequent years in administrative ministry in El Salvador had insulated him from the reality into which, into which he had been born. But now, reacclimatated, he responded immediately and concretely. His lifelong love for the Eucharist became embodied in the suffering of the poor. In Romero's two years as Bishop of Santiago de Maria, he learned to identify and truly love the crucified peoples of his homeland. In the faces of the poor and in their stories of sickening oppression and injustice, Romero's devotion to the crucified Jesus and the Eucharist took on a human identity. In February of 1977, Bishop Gerarda, the papal nuncio, announced the selection of his recommended candidate Oscar Romero as Archbishop of San Salvador. The news disappointed many of the clergy. In their previous experience of Romero, they had found him to be reluctant to embrace the new pastoral activities and methods. Furthermore, <coughs> Romero's appointment as Archbishop coincided with increasing political unrest. The previous month, the wave of clergy expulsions from the country had begun. In the city's capital, demonstrations gathered in the Plaza Libertad to protest the fraudulent election of the president. The government sent troops to establish order, but the troops fired upon the protesters, killing some while others fled. In mid-March, the ultimate turning point for Romero would occur. From the time of his arrival to live at the seminary of San Salvador in 1967, Romero had forged a friendship with Jesuit Rutilio Grande, who served as prefect of discipline, professor of pastoral theology, and director of pastoral ministry. For his Episcopal ordination in 1970, Romero had asked Rutilio Grande to assume the responsibility for its preparation, and Rutilio had accepted Romero's request wholeheartedly, and Romero never forgot Rutilio's great generosity. Even after Romero left to assume his Episcopal ministry, the two men maintained communication. The increasing signs of political tension personally impacted Romero. The government censure of foreign clergy resulted in the cruel kidnapping and expulsion of Father Mario Bernal, a native of Colombia. 
Rutilio Grande had preached in protest of the government's action, thus placing himself in peril. In addition, several of Grande's parish team members were not Salvadorian, and trying to protect his brother Jesuits from exposure to danger, Grande assumed many of their pastoral responsibilities, including the novena for the pastoral feast, patronal feast of St. Joseph in Trutilio's hometown of El Paisnal. On the third day of the novena, Grande began the drive to El Paisnal, accompanied by Manuel Solorzano, a 72-year-old delegate of the word, and Nelson Frutilio Lemus, a 16-year-old boy. As Grande drove the road that ran parallel to the sugarcane fields, assailants shot into the front and back of the Jeep, killing the priest and his two companions. Frutilio Grande had devoted his ministry in the pastoral effort of consciousness raising among those who worked the land. He lived and died in solidarity with the struggles of the poor and marginalized. Rutilio Grande was 49 years old. The death of Grande shocked all those who knew him. It especially impacted Oscar Romero, the newly appointed Archbishop of El Salvador. It had been about three weeks since his appointment. The life and death of this good man, whom he considered a brother, impelled Romero to journey further into the mystery of not only the crucified Christ, but the suffering of the crucified peoples of El Salvador. At Grande's funeral, Romero delivered his first recorded homily as Archbishop of El Salvador. As was his custom, Romero drew from both the word of God and the papal teachings, but now the imagery of the suffering masses became more pronounced in his words. In his sermon, he used Pope Paul VI's words on the, change, uh, on the challenge of evangelization, and I quote, what is the role of the church in this universal struggle for liberation from so much misery, end of quote. Romero's answer, the church cries out on behalf of those who remain on the margin of life. It cannot absent itself from struggle. A week later, in yet another sermon, Romero proclaimed, the church has listened to the cries of malnutrition, illiteracy, marginalization, and the Pope says that the church cannot be indifferent before the voices of millions of people. But personally, for me, the emergence of the image of the crucified Christ appears most poignantly in his sermon of May the 29th, 1977. Within days of Grande's death, the military had taken over the parish town of Aguilares and turned the church into barracks. In his sermon, Romero refers to that reality as he speaks to the people, and he says, how could the church not be pained when the most beautiful sign of the presence of God on earth, the Eucharist, has been trampled upon in Aguilares? How could the church not be pained when they have used a hatchet to break open the tabernacle? Two months later, Romero was finally able to return to re-sanctify the church in Aguilares, and there he addresses the people. I have the sad task of gathering up the bodies of those who have been abused the victims of this persecution of the church. Today, I have come to gather this church and convent that has been profaned, this tabernacle that has been destroyed, and above all, and above all, to gather up this people that has been humiliated and unnecessarily sacrificed. As he continued in his sermon, Romero drew the undeniable connection between the crucified Christ and the crucified people of Aguilares, and he says to the people, you, you 
are an image of the wrong divinity that is spoken about. Language that represents Christ nailed to the cross and pierced by a lance. You are the image of all people who like yourselves have been pierced and abused. And a few weeks later, on the feast of the body and blood of Christ, Romero's words return to that imagery proclaiming, in the symbol of the host trampled upon in Aguilares, we see the face of Christ on the cross. And in fact, it's also the countless faces of its townspeople. Over the next three years of his life and episcopacy, Romero's sermons continue to be informed by scripture, the teachings of the church, and the papal documents. But the plight of the poor intensified Romero's comprehension of the desperate realities in his country. Let me end by quoting a generous portion of a sermon that he preached in July of 1977. At the close of the council, the Pope states, this council has taught us to look to Christ and from Christ to look at each person. Let us look at the face of each person and see it become more transparent and beautiful as it's purified from pain, poverty, anguish, and suffering. This face is the face of Christ. The face of one who suffered and was crucified. The face of a poor man and a saint. And in the face of every person, we learn to see the face of Christ. As a shepherd, Romero was obligated to defend his own. On Sunday, March the 23rd, 1980, he appealed to the army's enlisted men in his sermon. Romero demanded that they stop killing their own countrymen and women. The following day, on March the 24th, 1980, while Romero was celebrating Eucharist, a lone assassin fired a shot to murder the archbishop. In the end, Romero's fidelity to God in prayer, to the truth of the gospel, and to the poor positioned him to render the shepherd's full sacrifice of life for his flock. Like Jesus, Romero's beginning in humble circumstances led him along a journey which culminated in the ultimate giving over of his life for his people, the ultimate expression of the call and cost of social justice. about 25 minutes for questions and we'd invite you to approach one of the two microphones here and alternate between the two. Thank you very much. Thank you, sister. You said that Romero was on a journey from like the Romero of 67 is on this intellectual journey um, and personal journey. Um, would you say that that journey is marked more by continuity or discontinuity with the early Romero? Like I'm, I'm trying to, you know, when I read Romero, sometimes I think, you know, I, I believe he claims for himself that, that he's only growing sort of in a way that's continuous with what he thought and believed earlier. Um, but so much seems um, different, that, that the critical consciousness seems to be in dis discontinuity in some ways with his earlier thinking. So if you could evaluate that, please. I was privileged um, to read some of Archbishop Romero's uh, personal uh, diaries. I actually met him in 1979. And my read of it is that he was always on a journey, sometimes step, three steps forward and 10 steps back. 
one step forward and two steps back, 10 steps forward and one step back. But there was this absolutely faithful attempt to love God and to seek the truth. And at different moments of his life, it was a new discovery, new insight, but he was always on this journey. And as I read his uh, personal journey, for example, the, the one example that I pointed out about his, he had a quick temper, a bad nature in many ways, you know. He inherited that from his father, apparently. And he would over and over again say in his diary, please God, I, I promise I'm going to be nicer to the priest. I'm going to speak to them. I can't imagine why he would be saying that, but um, I, I'm going to try not to be so elusive. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that constantly. I mean, it was like every other thought. He, he was always on this journey to be better, to try better. Uh, and sometimes the truth appeared to him in one way, but as he went along in his journey, he saw different things that led him into a deeper meaning. I mean, I think for him, one of the turning points was Santiago de Maria. He couldn't run away from it. He saw the poverty. He saw these poor children. He saw the men who were working the coffee fields, and at night, that's where they slept, on the coffee field ground. And they had no place. And he opens up the church, and he starts to insist that they prepare something hot for them to drink at night and they would have a place to come in from the, the damp cold, and they would sit at the tables, and he would sit with them and hear the stories. So to me, it's a journey, and it's part of, of a journey, and ultimately, it leads them to the final moment of the journey. I don't know if that answers your... But there are, I mean... A, he loved the Second Vatican Council, and he hated uh, Medellin, he thought Medellin was uh, a step away. And then later, in one of his sermons, he says, as some of us know, we should, be, we should adopt Medellin. It's a good council document. And, and, and reminded himself, perhaps, that he himself had not espoused it in the beginning. Thank you for the beautiful talk. I have the impression when Romero was younger, he was very strict and had an issue with what they used to call scrupulosity. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is coordinated with or reflects faith in a God who's judging, who's demanding, who's exacting. And then when we have this Romero, we have a, a Romero who is both very courageous, but also immersed in this deep piety of the tenderness of God that I think we hear echoed in Pope Francis as well. The, I want to know about this transition and how the psychology, if you can do it, how the psychology interacts with the theology. That is, how his sense of moving past the scrupulosity that was trapping him and keeping him at a distance from people changed and did that come with a change in his piety and his understanding of God, the tenderness of God, and how that gets spread into his view of solidarity? Well, he never lost his scrupulosity. It was always with him, and he always had to find ways to deal with it. So that was part of, I mean, that to me is the beauty of Romero, his fragility and his humanness. And for me, it gives me hope how a person riddled with such limitations and human frailties, like all of us are, can try and take it and find in that the grace of God and find himself. So Romero never loses his scrupulosity. He always had, uh, he never loses his uh, outburst of temper. He, he learns how to um, soften it. He learns perhaps how to, to do uh, something different to change his behavior. But if I were to look at um, his early behavior as a child, uh, they say that his uh, love for the Eucharist, and he would lose himself in prayer. He couldn't have been. I went to the church, the photo that I showed, and I imagined him in that church kneeling at the age of eight or seven or nine or 10 at the foot of the tabernacle and just being lost in prayer. And he loved his father. 
his own uh, biological father. And so I think his image of God was probably a tender God, a compassionate God. And in his diary, uh, that's what you, you find, or that's what I've found. I don't find him um, relating to a God that's demanding or um, harsh. Uh, it's all the opposite. I don't know how that answers the question, but if it does. Thank you. Um, I didn't know that much about uh, Oscar Romero before your talk, but in my mind, he was uh, associated with, you know, uh, uh, someone from the left, and uh, there was a controversy associated with him. So I didn't know all this about, uh, you know, he was seen as a conservative, and the priest didn't like him, and so <laughs> forth. So how did he? And why do I have this association in my mind? And how did he? Um, become controversial? Well, that's a good question. And maybe that's what's holding up his canonization. I was hoping today was going to be the day they were going to make the big announcement. Um, I think he's associated with the left because, let me share this little story. When I met him, August the 17th, 1979, I had a little 15 or 20 minute conversation and it was clear that what he was trying to do as a spiritual leader of El Salvador in his, in his uh, role as pastor, to try and facilitate the conversation between the right and the left, what was going on. But in El Salvador, it doesn't take much and I'm telling you because of my own family history, you even stand next to Romero in a photo and you're already being aligned with one side or another. Romero even talked to, um, as shows in a documentary, talked to people in the military, then that was a sign that he was in the left. That he uh, stood up every Sunday and talked about the abuses of what was happening in the country and mentioned by name the massacres or the horrible uh, uh, take abuse of life that was occurring in the surrounding villages and towns, and that alone would be enough to say he was a communist. It didn't take much. Uh, and so I think he's often associated to the left because his stance was radical. Well, yes, it was radical. It was radical Christianity. It was radical as a leadership. That's what he should have been doing. But in the Salvador of that time, it wasn't the church and the government were oftentimes seen more as partners than, than the opposite. So I think that's part of the, of the reason why he's often perhaps connected, but not connected in a critical way perhaps to the left. And uh... Uh, Thank you, it was really quite moving. Uh, I'm wondering if you could uh, fill in a little bit more about Rutilio Grande's influence on his uh, uh, emotional growth, his spiritual growth, and how he came to be uh, uh, so, so fond to the hearts of all of us and so privileged for your encounter with him. Uh, it, it, it seemed it, it's especially moving that you had these images of him and the overturned Jeep and all that, that they're... they're uh, ought to be as much hope for recognition of, of uh, Rotilo Grande yes. in the telling the tale. Okay. Well, I may disappoint you in the tale because I have a different um, reading of the tale. So this is my assessment. Romero was always on the journey of conversion like all of us are. And along the way, we are helped by friends, by family, by enemies, by men and women who help each one of us understand some things more clearly. And in 1967, Romero, when he comes to the seminary of San Salvador, because he's going to be the secretary for the Conference of Bishops, he meets Rutilio Grande for the first time. At that time, Rutilio Grande is probably one of the only native Salvadoreños at the seminary. And my theory is Romero himself 
uh, I mean, Rutilio himself was a very fragile man psychologically. Uh, there's much to be said about from Rutilio's own um, struggles with his own human fragility and limitations. And the two men met. Rutilio extended to him hospitality because Romero was not well received. He had just criticized the Jesuits from the newspaper that he had edited before leaving San Miguel. He had a public uh, kind of battle going on with the uh, outrageous young Jesuits that were doing everything wrong and liberation theology, and he was talking about it from the newspaper. And even when Romero was asked to take it back publicly, he took, takes it back and then just restates his position in the newspaper. <laughs> so that's Romero. And my theory is that these two men, both fragile in different ways, meet. And sometimes we have kindred sp spirits. We know each other. We see in each other our own. We, we mirror to each other who we are. And Rutilio was so kind to Romero from the beginning. And he made it easier for Romero to be accepted in the seminary setting. And then, as I understand it, Rutilio was also like a dialogue or a conversation partner in different things. And so Romero learned from Rutilio, but I think Rutilio learned from Romero. And Rutilio was 10 years younger than Romero, but nevertheless, he always kept an eye on Romero and tried to get his own colleagues and peers to help Romero, even when nobody wanted to help Romero. Rutilio would say to his ministerial team, make sure you help him, find a way to help him. How did he do? He'd go to the sermons, what did he say? So there was this ongoing relationship. Romero deeply loved Rutilio, and there was a friendship there. But I was told by uh, some people that I interviewed that it's not this friendship that has been engrandized in the myth of the Rutilio Romero relationship. And sometimes what we have been told is Rutilio gets killed and then Romero just turns around a 360 and he's converted and he becomes this outspoken uh, pastor and leader of the church. Well, I think it affected him. I mean, as any of us would be affected by a love member who was murdered. And the thing with Rutilio is that Rutilio was known as a beloved person in the archdiocese, not only by the priest and the clergy, but by the lay people. And he was considered a good man. So this uh, murder was shocking. But the other thing that's shocking is it's a Catholic country. You don't touch a priest in any manner. And to have a priest been killed and to have slogans smeared on the walls, be a patriot, kill a priest, was a terrible time in Catholic El Salvador. So a murder of, of a friend, of a loved one, that like happened to Rutilio, yes, it would change Romero, but I think it's part of the journey. It is a change, but part of the journey, and maybe it was the next step that he needed to understand what he had to do as pastor and leader of the church. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. <laughs> you Are, you back at school? Did not Are you back at school? Are you back at school? That's a much, that's a, a, a very rich uh, way of putting exactly what I had in mind, but to get all these details, and it, it it's really makes the challenge for us to go and do likewise with one another. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Sister, that's context of a journey, I think, has, I have found so helpful in getting a greater appreciation of Romero. Um, and as you said, uh, his time in Santiago de Maria was a very key moment. <clears throat> For those of us that are pastors, teachers, leaders uh, in the American Catholic Church, or our bishops, I don't know if we have a chance for that kind of, or can you, th can you suggest some ways in which we ourselves or for those we're seeking to teach and lead can foster that, that kind of journey that will lead in that direction? I think I'm left speechless. <laughs> I don't know. 
I, I think uh, last night they asked Stephen Pope a question, like how can we face uh, the world with such impossibilities? And I kept thinking, there's a resilience of people who are in situations like those in El Salvador and other countries of the world, and somehow there is this hope. Sometimes uh, there is um, an insight that helps us become a better person. I was reading uh, in a couple of days ago in some news release that the Archbishop of El Salvador, who is considered a rather conservative figure, actually on the feast of Rutilio's death, which is uh, March the 12th, he went to El Paisnal and delivered this really interesting homily and said, I ask forgiveness because I have ignored uh, all those people who have died in the pursuit of justice in El Salvador, the martyrs, those without a name, the North American sisters, Rutilio Grande. And I thought to myself, and the title of it was, uh, Rutilio Grande inspires yet another archbishop. So maybe there are people in our lives that are going to inspire us. <coughs> and maybe our attempts every day to get up and be a better person in one way can be a source of inspiration for someone else. Um, I think it's these uh, small gestures of human improvement. We're talking about global development and the progress of peoples, and but the progress of people has to begin with us and with the communities, you know, uh, laboring together, as Stephen Pope also mentioned last night. Does that help? I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the unusual solar event that occurred at uh, Romero's beatification oh, yes. and what that meant to you. Yeah. So there I was with 400,000 people. I'd like to think there were 400,000. It <laughs> felt like it was 400,000 people. And it was absolutely moving. You can't even describe the emotion. And uh, we're in the hot sun, uh, I forget, late morning. And I think it was uh, Cardinal Amato that said something like, and now we have uh, a saint in the heavens, in the, another star in the heavens. And at that moment, the crowd just stopped and they started looking up at the sky and a, a circular rainbow appeared in the sky, a circular rainbow. It was literally like a dome at that moment appeared over in the sky and, we, and everybody was looking up speechless and it stayed almost the entire ceremony from that moment on. And so we all said, you know, what more signs do we want? Latinos are very sign driven, you know, what more <laughs> sign do we want? He is another star in the heavens and it was a great a moment of rejoicing. I should have added it to the slides. I had it somewhere, but, but that was a, a beautiful moment. A crowning moment. Well, that may be a nice image to bring our time to closure with, uh, a crowning moment on this anniversary of Romero's uh, martyrdom. Thank you so much, uh, Ana Maria. And please join me in thanking Ana Maria. Thank you. Thank you.